Welcome back. So we've been talking about operator learning methods uh, with neural networks. And today I'm going to talk through um, this method called neural implicit flow, developed by Xiaowu Pan when he was a postdoc working with me and Nathan Kutz. So this is a JMLR paper uh, from 2023. And this is a picture of the neural implicit flow architecture. So you'll notice it's actually, it looks a lot like a deep O net. So it looks a lot like uh, this kind of classic deep operator network from uh, uh, Carniodacus et al, where you have a trunk net and a branch net, this kind of split networks that you then recombine later. Um, Xiaowu Pan's neural implicit flow uh, has a similar kind of split between a shape net and a parameter net. So I'm going to talk through how this works, uh, what you can do with this, and it's actually really, really cool. Um, this is one of my, I'm very partial because like we, you know, developed it when he was at UW with us. Um, but I think it's a really, really clever way of splitting a network to do different tasks with different auxiliary networks. And I've, we've, you know, I've, I've liked the idea of auxiliary networks parameterizing a network uh, for a while. I think it's a clever idea. So the idea of the shape net is that this is going to actually be a lot like a pins kind of network. It's going to model uh, some output field of interest, like some velocity field, as a function of maybe space. And then this parameter network is going to parameterize that shape net with things like, you know, the Mach number and the Reynolds number of the fluid flow or, you know, parameters that you can change in the system. Or maybe as time, you know, time can be enter into this parameter net. And as time evolves and my solution changes, this parameter net will modulate the shape net so my solution function u of x changes in time. Okay, so I think this is kind of a nice way of separating out the things that are largely spatial, that's kind of what the shape net means, and things that are lar largely exogenous, like time, parameters, control inputs down here. Okay, so a really cool idea, and again, pretty closely related to both deep operator networks and pins uh, in some pretty interesting ways. So let's just talk about you know, a really, really simple example. This is kind of what I was talking about. Your shape net is essentially modeling your field of interest, like your velocity field as a function of space. And your parameter network is uh, capturing the effect of if there's parameters I vary, like Reynolds number or Mach number or something like that, or time, that all happens in the parameter net. And these shape functions can change with time or as I vary that parameter for different Mach numbers or Reynolds numbers. And so you train with PDE solutions at different parameter values and as they evolve in time, you train these networks and then you can predict your PDE solution at different new parameters mu and new times t. Now, I would really, uh, again, I always want you to be thinking critically, and you know, just because it's our paper doesn't mean you should be not thinking critically. Um, is this only going to work for interpolation of mu's, or might it extrapolate for new mu's? So if I have sampled these mu values, these parameter values here, here, and here, I'm pretty sure this will interpolate for intermediate mu's, but can I use it to extrapolate to a new mu that I've never seen before? That's usually very, very hard, so I would be skeptical. I would like you to be skeptical too. But that's something you can actually try. You can download this code, you can try those different experiments and verify for yourself, oh, this works for interpolation in mu, but it's not gonna be amazing for extrapolation in mu, except under certain circumstances. So that would be interesting uh, to verify yourself. Okay, so this is, and you'll see that the shape net then starts to look a lot like a, you know, the, the neural network that you would use in a pins architecture. You're just modeling your solution uh, U as a function of space X. Except now I've moved time down here to this auxiliary parameter network. So shape functions up here uh, and all of my other exogenous or external uh, variations down here. Um, and I actually really like this example. This is used for compressing really, really, really big turbulent data. These are huge uh, isotropic turbulence data sets with resolution 128 cubed. So a movie of this thing uh, is actually going to be very, very large. And with this shape net, with a multi-scale shape net, 
Now, I, we are representing this as just a rectangle, but you know that under the hood, there's a lot of stuff happening in this shape net. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like later. There are kind of ResNet versions of shape net. There are multi-scale shape nets. There's a lot you can choose to represent these shape functions here. Um, but with an appropriate multi-scale shape net, you can actually build a very compressed version of this data set. Um, and actually, this is something that surprised all of us when Xiaowu um, shared this result with us, is if you think about this as a compression paradigm, you take this huge data, you train the parameters of your shape net and your parameter net. This is a lot less data to store these networks than these flow fields. And then this is actually the compression. This is like the MPEG compressed version of this movie are just the neural network weights here. Because now I can reconstruct the movie by putting in my spatial grid and my time vector, and this network will reproduce this turbulence field here. So Xiaowu actually showed that you can get really, really strong compression using this neural implicit flow architecture. I thought that was really cool. So you're learning shape functions that are efficient for capturing this particular flow evolution. Um, another example is you can combine this with sparse sensor placement uh, techniques like QDIME. So we've talked about um, sparse sensor placement before where you have some high dimensional system, it has patterns, and so you want to put targeted sensors down to maximally estimate those patterns. Uh, similarly, you can use that idea here in the shape net to um, essentially use optimal sensor locations to estimate full flow field data um, you know, using these sparse measurements here. So if you have sparse measurements of a new flow field, you can use those sparse measurements to infer what all of the other measurements would be at all other points x, y, and z. So that is a pretty useful idea. Your training data would be high resolution images and some select point sensors. Your point sensors go into your parameter net. Your high resolution data would be, you know, the inputs and outputs of this, this shape net. And you'd train that a bunch so that now if you had new sparse sensor locations in this parameter net, this combined neural implicit flow architecture would be able to reconstruct the field at any x, y, and z. Very cool idea, and it works really, really well for systems that have strong patterns like this uh, sea surface temperature across the surface of the Earth. Again, I would be asking questions if I were you, like, you know, I'm pretty sure that this data is relatively low rank. I think that the sea surface temperature is not a super complex um, high dimensional data set, so I would wonder how this would work on a more complicated flow. Um, and then the other thing uh, that I think is neat about this neural implicit flow is that it inherits ideas from uh, deep operator networks and from kind of neural operators. That's why it's called neural implicit flow. Um, the idea being that you can also work with arbitrary mesh um, and arbitrary resolutions. This is really cool because this is, because the shape net is kind of like the neural network you would use in a pins where it's just you know the velocity fields that I care about as a function of x, y, and z. I can train that network on points that came from a random irregular mesh. I can train it from data where each snapshot in time is on a different mesh. I can train it for, basically I can train this on data from kind of mesh agnostic data. And that's a huge, huge benefit. That's one of the hardest things when we are dealing with actual engineering systems. So it's easy to play around with a Fourier neural operator you know, for fluid flow in a periodic box with a uniform mesh, that's easy. But if I am trying to design a race car or an aircraft wing or a wind turbine blade, that geometry over my design cycle is, the geometry is changing, the mesh is changing. And so it's very hard to use, uh, you know, neural networks when my mesh is actually changing, when the representation of how I discretize space changes, um, you know, 
uh, I, over time or over um, you know different designs of my geometry. And that's one of the things that got uh, us the most excited about this neural implicit flow is that it actually works for data you know on arbitrary meshes. You can have nasty meshes, the meshes can be changing, they can change for different parameters. But because this shape net is just a function, the output fields as a function of X, Y, and T, I can put in different X, Y, and T at those weird irregular mesh locations. So really, really cool um, idea here is that you can actually work with arbitrary mesh data. That's super powerful. And I know uh, colleagues in industry you know, uh, are using this because that's one of the features that's hardest is irregular meshes. Um, and this is just you know more benchmark data showing kind of what would happen if you had different MLPs with different activation functions, or you know Fourier kind of neural networks or Siren layers. And the upshot here is that as you go from left to right, the ground truth is on the right. The neural implicit flow, this method here, is the second to the right, and it is most faithfully capturing the true physics um, of this, I believe, decaying isotropic turbulence. And it's also really good for, you know, things like, uh, again, irregular um, meshes are sometimes needed for things like growing vortices um, and things like that. And the neural implicit flow, NIF, does a really, really, really good job of capturing the actual high fidelity uh, interface of this growing uh, vortex. These are cool pictures. I like cool pictures. I wanted to share them with you. It's a beefy paper. You can download this and read it yourself. You can download the code. Um, you know, it's it's not a light read. This is not a uh, a simple quick read. But I would encourage you to check it out and see what you uh, what you get from it. And then I mentioned that there are a lot of different uh, ways you can actually build that shape net. So there's a lot of customization. You can use all of your intuition of how you think you can represent those spatial functions. Um, you as a function of x. So you can use things like, um, this looks a lot like a, a residual network. You can use something kind of akin to a ResNet with siren layers, or you can build something that's akin to a UNet if you wanted to. So your shape net, there's a lot of flexibility here. And by offloading the time dependence and the parametric dependence to the parameter net, you can have the shape net do what it does best, which is represent these spatial functions using either a ResNet or a UNet or something, you know, something like that. Okay, so that is the mile high view of neural implicit flow. Um, Xiaowu has a really cool video on this that I'll put in the description. Um, check it out, download the code, try it out. Try to see where it breaks. Email us if you break it. Um, email us if you fix it or extend it. Think about how you can add physics in here. What if I know about some symmetry my solutions have to have? Or I know about some symmetry in my parameters or in time. How do I bake in that prior knowledge of physics into these uh, kinds of architectures? Or maybe I can take this latent representation here that allows these two networks to talk to each other. Maybe I can do diagnostics on that. Maybe I can apply Cindy and learn ODE models for those time series um, in that latent space. A lot of interesting things. We've just scratched the tip of the surface. It's a very exciting area to be working in because all of these operator methods are pretty new and there's a lot of, you know, they don't always work. They're, they break a lot, so there's a lot of opportunities to upgrade them, fix them, extend them, analyze them more, um, and I think it'll be fun for you to try it out yourself. All right, thank you.